Rebecca Paulson is going to conduct that. She assures me it will be short, and uh, and as part of that, she's going to introduce the board members who are here. So, without further ado, Rebecca Paulson. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, thanks for coming. The Maritime Heritage Society is dedicated to preserving and educating the public about the maritime heritage of Alaska, and our main project is rehabilitating the Japonsky Island Boathouse as... <laughs> do you need a mic? Uh, I guess I do. The main project is to, is to rehabilitate the Japonsky Island Boathouse as a maritime heritage center with a working boat shop and boat hell out. And um, just really briefly, the activities over the past year, the mainland has been waiting on a uh, National Scenic Byways grant for the architectural design, so that should be getting underway this um, next spring. And uh, waiting on uh, getting all the paperwork worked out for uh, fuel dock to go in on the corner of the boathouse um, property. And uh, we have the Sika Sound Ocean Adventure Race, the first annual. We grill black pot at Alaska Day. Beta Segment Y did their art auction this past year. Um, we have a board member election tonight. If uh, members can pick up a ballot at the door um, and vote, the current board members are uh, myself, Matt Hunter. Maybe people can just raise their, their hand as uh, <laughs> it's Matt Hunter in the back. Matt's way in the back there. Yeah, Deuce Audette. There's Deuce. Uh, Mike Lipman. Mike. <laughs> Linda Blankenship. Uh, Jerry Dugan is not in town. Joe Darienzo. Um, and we have two new board members for confirmation tonight. Mark Gorman and Jan Steinbright, who was on our board formerly. And Mike Lippman and I are up for re-election. Um, and we'd also like to take the opportunity tonight to thank Sika Sound Seafoods for their help with our black cod grilling fundraiser. Um, I don't know if there's a <laughs> representative, <laughs> but uh, thank you very much. It's a picture for the office. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I was just going to say a couple things. Yeah, One, that, uh, why don't you just use my mic? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's there one you go. too. I think that one's hot too. That one's hot. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much um, for this award, and we'll put this in our office in the entranceway of the main office. And Sitka Sound has been a, a very large part of the history of the maritime industry here in Sitka for many, many years, and, and we're very honored to be able to, con to contribute to this organization and, and the projects that they're trying to accomplish. And I think we hope that down the road more and more people in Sitka will realize how important this industry really is to us and that we can continue to get your support for us for the different issues that are facing us. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, also a big thank to the, thanks to the Alaska Humanities Forum for funding the photo e exhibition tonight uh, by Matt Donahoe. These photos are from slides taken from the late 70s and early 80s. And some of the prints are not quite all they could be, and we're going to um, you know, try to tweak those and, and get them framed and have them up for a longer period sometime in the future. And thank you to everyone who's joined the Maritime Heritage so Society. This is very important as we uh, move toward completion of the boathouse, and um, even more for being a part of preserving our history. And here's Eric Jordan and our panel. Well, thank you. And Mike, do you have something to add? Can I say something before you start? Rebecca's too nice to say. Is there any it. objection to uh, many of the agenda? <laughs> <laughs> You're not well, I think all right. <laughs> Rebecca's too nice to say it, so I will say this organization runs on memberships. And the more memberships we have, the, the more uh, money we can attract from outside. And it's going to take a lot of money to, to uh, refurbish the boathouse and get it working again and, and all the other projects. And Rebecca and everybody else on the board are great at writing grants and attracting uh, support. But it starts with membership. So I hope everybody will consider joining. That's all I have. Thanks.
on to you, Mike. And let's all give a big hand in America. Our agenda for tonight is uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists, and then they will uh, they each have a little bit of the Southeast history to share. And then we're going to have a discussion. We're going to invite people to come right up where Mike and uh, Rebecca were. And uh, you can come up, and as you're getting ready to, to come up, you can pay up in the front row and then come up and uh, take your turn speaking. And we really want to hear your stories, but we're only going to let one guy tell a really long story, and he's on our panel, and those of you who know Trolling knows who that is, because you've probably heard his stories on Channel 77. <laughs> And that's going to be my job. We're going to try and be done uh, close to, uh, but not later than, 9 o'clock. And uh, before I get started, though, these are wonderful portraits and uh, pictures that uh, Matt Donahoe has up there. And I also have my little laptop set up with, uh, right now it's showing some portraits of fishermen, but I also have uh, pictures of boats and then of some uh, from the time we saw the fish on the fathometer until we were eating it at the barbecue. Uh, a little series there, a little story. So that's on the laptop at the end when we get done tonight. Uh, take an opportunity, we'll rotate those through and you can uh, enjoy the wonderful pictures that we have here tonight. So without further ado, what I'm going to do first is introduce all the panel members and then we'll start off with, uh, with some of the stories. Immediately on my right is John Steele, a longtime Southeast fisherman, and we have a connection in that uh, he used to fish the Judith, right? And my uh, stepfather, the man who married my mother, Bill George, who just passed away this fall, bought the Judith and also fished the Judith. So John and I, like most trollers in Southeast, have a connection through common boats. And uh, immediately to his right is Sherry Tuttle, who's a long-time uh, Southeast troller, served on the uh, Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, the Alaska Trollers Association Board of Directors, and has become relatively famous for her very high-quality frozen fish in developing markets for that. And immediately on her right is Charlie Wilbur, who presently uh, is chairman of the uh, Seafood Producers Cooperative, but also gained some infamy, and we have a family-type connection in that I crewed for him halibut fishing for uh, several openings a number of years ago, during which we got to, during one opening, we got to experience running out of water, the stove breaking down, the bilge pump breaking down after we loaded the boat and going off incessantly, which made Charlie kind of nervous, and the third crew member who's passed away, so I can mention it now, had uh, some kind of sleep apnea, so when he was sleeping, neither Charlie or I could sleep. So uh, that was quite an experience, fishing with Charlie. Uh, someday I'll write a book about it. And immediately on Charlie's right is uh, Ralph Guthrie, who uh, I also have a connection with. Ralph and I both uh, spent a good part of our life in uh, Petersburg, and when Ralph moved to Sitka a number of years ago, he took uh, me and some of the guys in our uh, small fishing group under his wing, bought us all radios so we could talk to each other on his secret channel, which only about 90% of the rest of the fleet had. <laughs> and uh, Ralph really, really helped me become a better fisherman and a better person. And uh, Ralph and I have uh, shared a lot of discussions over the years, and uh, Ralph is one of the guys who not only is a true highliner in terms of the production he's had over the years, but in terms of his contribution to the fisheries. I know one time Ralph, during the middle of a halibut opening, when another guy broke down, left his gear on the grounds and went out when everybody else was too busy and helped tow a guy in. So we're going to start off our panel with a story on a perspective of the Southeast troll industry from Ralph Guthrie. Please welcome Ralph Guthrie. And Ralph, there's a little button there to push to turn it on. It's off. 
said really touched home to me and I want you guys in the audience to think about it and the other panelists part of the reason we're trollers is because we're passionate about this fishery most of us aren't making a huge amount of money in this fishery we could probably be doing as well or better doing something else and Ralph said talked about his romance with salmon 
And that's what we have. We have a romance with the wonderful species that we're fishing, these cohos and king salmon, and some of us fishing chums. And we have a romance with our boats. We love our boats. And we have a romance with this wonderful country that we live in out here. And to a certain extent, we romance each other. Not, not just as potential spouses or stuff, but <laughs> there's a certain amount of romance in every coding group. <laughs> you can do a hole, Eric. <laughs> and on every crew. So when we think about that t tonight, I, I think, and we think of the history of this, I think romance, the romance we have with this industry, it needs to be part of the theme. Thank you, Ralph. And uh, Charlie? Mike said that uh, the Maritime Heritage Society was going to have some old-timer geese and bullshitters here tonight to uh, talk about trolling. I didn't realize I was going to be one of them. So. <laughs> that being said, uh, I thought I'd just give a, a real short uh, history of the co-op since the co-op and salmon trolling are intertwined and it, it, it's pretty interesting little bit of history and the co-op started in 1943 during the war uh, there were guys fishing sharks and shark livers and uh, they had a very high vitamin A content and the uh, military found vitamin A to be a uh, real good supplement for night vision for pilots. So it became a real prized commodity and back then they were getting nine dollars a pound for their shark livers. So it, it was a big business for them. They, a group of fishermen in Seattle got together and that was really the uh, beginning of the co-op. Of course shortly after that the government put a freeze on uh, uh, acquiring war materials, the price went way down, and then uh, they started making synthetic vitamin A. So they had to look elsewhere, like all fishermen do, you had to diversify a little bit. And I guess the other interesting part in our history was in 1964, during the big earthquake that I'm sure most of you know about in Anchorage, our only plant was in Seward at that time, and uh, it was completely wiped out by the tsunami that came in there. Our whole plant literally disappeared. The good thing about it was it was during dinner break, so there was hardly any loss of life, but that put the co-op in a really shaky uh, foundation. And then finally, in 1980, uh, our board decided to build a plant here, and uh, unlike some of the good deals that uh, the uh, that are now coming forth, uh, I won't try to get too political here. I'm sorry, but uh, when we uh, when we built our plant, we built the raw. We got the raw land. We had to build the dock. We had to build the plant. We had to get our own generator for electricity, and we paid the city two hundred and twenty thousand a year lease on the land alone. And that fact almost brought the co-op to its knees, and we darn near went out of business if it hadn't been for a few members who made some interest, no interest loans. So anyway, we're back in business, and uh, the co-op buys the overwhelming percentage of the uh, troll production on the West Coast, which I guess you could say the world. So. Anyway, thanks, Eric. Charlie, I'm going to I'm going to ask you to tell some other troll stories here as the evening goes along, but we'll we'll let you go with uh, with that, and uh, and uh, we really appreciate that, and uh, not only the co-op but all the fish buyers. Sitka is. 
leading the way in the value for salmon, especially because we have the winter king salmon here, but it's not just the function of one plant. We have uh, the competition here in Sitka is really leading the way for the state in the value of salmon, especially the uh, high value winter king troll caught salmon. And that leads us right into, when we talk about high quality, turn on the mic, that leads us right to Sherry Tuttle, who, uh, when I was uh, showing her one of my uh, very high quality dressed fish, of course, she mentioned that it wouldn't meet her standards. <laughs> so, uh, back to, uh, back to uh, the drawing board on that one. So, without further ado, Sherry Tuttle. to be here. I don't know that I belong with all these highliners here. When I started fishing, I, I started fishing in 1965, and I don't often admit that. It really dates me. But I've spent 24 years as a hand troller, learning the, the ropes, camping on the beach, and going in and out and thinking I was making enough money so that someday I could move to southeast Alaska, because I lived in California at the time. When I was in college, I would come up, and it was a lot more fun to fish than it was to work in a restaurant or do some of the jobs that one would have to do to get tuition and books. So I spent a lot of time with, out on the water with the boat. I had a 16-foot skiff and a 10-horsepower outboard. And I fished out of Petersburg. And I got the Marine View, which was a packer for the NEFCO 11, which was a, a, a fish buyer, to take me out to the fishing grounds. And I spent all summer out there. And camping on the beach was probably one of the, the highlights of what I did. I love to be outdoors. I love to go fishing. I love the early morning bite. 1965 was before limited entry. And at that time, in that area, there were quite a few native fishermen out in skiffs as well. And I learned a lot from them in terms of uh, how to do baits, and how to fish, and where to go. And it was a really rewarding time. And then, when I got real serious about fishing, when I found out that everybody else that had, that had a bigger boat was on the outside coast was making money hand over fist, while I was there, happy with my humpies and hoping that I would have a better season next year. So I bought a power troll permit in 1989. And from 1965 to 1989, I think I missed one season fishing. That's why I was working on my master's degree. And I regretted staying down that one summer, even though I, I just went nuts, so wishing I could be back up camping on the beach and, and fishing. But in 1989, I bought the boat called the June Rose. It's a 40-foot double ender. And went power trolling, and finally realized that I could support myself living in Southeast Alaska. So I quit my job and came up and started as a full-time troller. I did a number of other little gigs myself um, in terms of working and, and, as everybody does, making it get along because winter fishing wasn't always easy in a real small skiff. And gradually, I traded up with my skiffs. I had a 10-foot. Uh, 16 foot uh, skiff with a 10 horse, horsepower outboard and then the next year I got a 16 foot skiff and then I had a 20 horsepower outboard and things were lots better and then when I got an 18 foot skiff I could sleep on it and that made things a lot easier too. <laughs> so I virtually traded coats as I, as I fished and I lived in Petersburg in the summertime and a lot of the people there would have skiffs available and I could, it was a wonderful place to fish out of. But uh, as soon as I started power trolling, that really started my romance with fish because it was such a challenge to be able to be out there and, and see the fish come up and see how beautiful they were. And uh, I, I made a mistake one day of having a, a bite of some frozen at sea salmon with some friends that were freezer trollers. And as soon as I ate that salmon in the middle of the winter time, I realized that freezing at sea was what I wanted to do. So in 1992, I bought the Rose, which is a 53-foot uh, catch rig uh, skookum and had a freezer put in it and started freezing. And so I had 15 years of great fishing with doing frozen at sea product. But the, the most fun was camping on the beach and not having responsibilities of a bigger boat. And when the wind came up, it was fun to go to the beach and dig clams. I know you don't do that much anymore, but we did then. And uh, have barbecues and a lot of the social things that go on. When the whole, most of the time when I was skiff fishing, I didn't have a radio. So I didn't hear Eric and I didn't hear Ralph. <laughs> but as soon as I got the, the June Rose, I could hear Ralph every winter. 
usually sitting in an anchorage with him blowing about 45 and listening to him talk about where he'd been and what he was doing. Ralph didn't even know me at the time, but I took a great delight in listening to both him and Eric on the radio. In, in particular, uh, Tevenkoff Bay, where I first started fishing, it's a very addictive bay, it's a beautiful place. And uh, I know that Eric was there too about that time, weren't you, Eric? Uh, yep, and I have a picture that my mother had over there when we get to the fishing uh, boats. Uh, little slideshow of Explorers Basin where, where I'm sure you camped out. And uh, yeah, I was in that country from uh, when I was born in 50, that's when my dad homesteaded until uh, he passed away in 65. And uh, wonderful country. And in addition, you know, to just tie that in, my grandfather hand trolled out of an open skip and had a tent on the beach, only that was in Gebney, also down there in Southern Channel. And that's Part of this history that Sherry's touching on, I'm going to get right back to you, Sherry, but that we used to call them puddle jumpers. Anybody remember that name, puddle jumpers? And uh, people that fished out of the skiffs and, you know, Sherry's alluding to how wonderful it was, but I'll tell you what, it was pretty tough, too. <laughs> and maybe you could touch a little bit on that, Sherry. Well, there were times when, uh, I, I remember I got a phone call from my stepmother called, and uh, they got a hold of the NEFCO 11 who went out to call one of the boats that was fishing about Gap Point, I'm sure you remember Gap Point, but uh, they looked around and there were probably 20 boats out there, and I was in a skiff, and the NEFCO 11 said, we're looking for two girls out there in the skiff, um, they, it's a red skiff with a 10 horsepower outboard, and somebody looked around and said, we don't see any girls out here at all. So I never got the phone call, but it was <laughs> sitting in my rain gear with my Southwester on. It wasn't very distinct out there. <laughs> but I can remember some times on the beach, and uh, in, in, actually it was Gidney Harbor where I was camping. I first got, went in and set up camp and was so excited about going fishing, I spent the next three days out getting the boat ready, getting gear ready, and fishing. And about the fourth day, I was going to get out early to get everything going and rolled out of my sleeping bag, put my hand out, and there was water in my tent. And the water was about six inches deep, and I had put my tent a little close to the, a little close to the tide line and didn't realize it, so I spent most of the day dragging everything up out of the water and moving further up the beach so that the next day I could get out. But yeah, there were some tough times there sometimes, especially when you got water in your boots. That was, that was tough, because usually they didn't dry out for about a week or so. But uh, when I moved to Sitka, uh, fishing kind of opened up for me. I met so many fishermen that had lots of expertise and uh, helped me learn the ropes of what to do. And uh, I spent, I'm still learning what to do, even though I just sold my boat last season, which I'm not sure how long I'll be without a boat, but uh, uh, I got to the point where I, I was getting a little tired of fishing. And uh, freezer, working a freezer boat at minus 40 degrees is, is kind of a, a different thing than working on an ice boat. I see Susie Howie's here. Susie was my deckhand on the Rose, and she worked in the freezer with me one season. But anyway, that's all I've got to say right now. Well, we're, we're going to come back to Sherry and ask her about uh, what makes for a real high quality uh, frozen at sea salmon. But uh, thank you, Sherry. Let's give her a big hand. so many of us with attachments to Petersburg and, uh, and uh, South Chatham. I see Walt Pasternak, my friend here, I know he started out in <laughs> Gidney and South Chatham hand trolling. And I, uh, I just put some time in hand trolling myself uh, when I started up again in the 70s. Anyway, John, um, I know you uh, started hand trolling too in the 60s and one of the things Rebecca wanted me to emphasize was People who came into this fishery, the lifestyle that led a lot of uh, young people to start into this fishery in the late 60s and 70s, kind of uh, an alternative way of living. And I don't know if you want to bring that up or uh, if you were part of that really or... Uh... <laughs> 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 
that soon. But I, I do remember, I remember your boat, your skiff, with the uh, Mercury Black Max 175. The biggest outboard ever built <laughs> to that day. Remember that? What was the name of that boat? Uh, well, depending on who was referring to it, if it was people on the, uh, at the drag with me, they, their name for it was the Crisscross. <laughs> and uh, my name for it was the Hoochie. Oh, okay. um, I uh, never skip fished. Uh, I, I caught, um, I had one hand here, I had a Yakutat um, set net skip I bought. I would. Uh, 15 footer with a. Uh, I got the bright idea to get this um, outboard called a British Seagull. It <laughs> had about 10 gallons of oil to one gallon of gasoline. In it. <laughs> and uh, it was really smoky. I had a hand dirty, and I, I think my first delivery was uh, five humpies that I actually caught with a sport rod and then ran out set the sound. <laughs> And that was my extent of my skill fishing. Um, and the next year I bought a, a real trawler. I started looking around and uh, somebody told me about a uh, boat for sale. Uh, Don Owens, the harbor master back then, uh, told me about a boat for sale, a 33-foot double ender. And I went and looked at it, and it looked great to me. And uh, it was but I didn't, I wasn't able to really see through the layers of paint. But the, the price was right. <laughs> so I, uh, I ended up buying it for $2,000. And uh, it was built in 1918, and I never rebuilt. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for instance, the frames, the ribs, were I, I always describe them as a vestigial. <laughs> You can see where they used to be. <laughs> but um, fishing was a pretty scary thing then. Uh, any kind of a journey, anything to do with the boat was uh, pretty... I knew nothing and I didn't really know anyone that knew much more. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, my main voyage, I, went, I made it up to Salisbury Sound. And that was just like the edge of the world. And I you know, got the anchor down. And, uh, um, I, I kind of knew how the gear worked. I never fished, never commercially fished, except with that hand dirty. I never really used real birdies or anything like that. And uh, so I, I was able to count the, the, the beads as the line went out. And uh, but I didn't know about that you want to that once you put the line on the tag line, you, it would go a couple fathoms deeper. I didn't know that. And I, and I didn't know another really important thing was to speed up if you started to. If your lad started banging rocks, and I didn't know enough even to follow other boats. So, everybody turned, but I didn't. The boats bent, and I, I was very fatalistic. I just stand there and think, oh no, and I got out and told the boat. And uh, everything broke off. Uh, so recovering all that uh, broken gear, I, I remember I caught a king salmon about 10 inches long, <laughs> which I thought was so cool because it looked just like I imagined a big one it looked. <laughs> and uh, I caught a little bit too. And, uh, so finally, about 5 in the afternoon, I was down to, I had been through all my gear and I was out well offshore. And I had two lines out. And, um, one of the poles started to bounce again, and I, uh, I thought, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I had a, uh, I only had two pieces of electronic. I had uh, electronics on the boat. I had a, a CB radio in the wheelhouse, and a coastal navigator fathometer in a box in the drawing pit. So I went back to the bed and left it, and it said uh, 45 fathoms. The light was blinking, though, and I tapped it, and I was turning <laughs> So that, well, I did the best of it. And, uh, so I, I had a uh, hand dirties on it, and I started to reel in the line. And um, towards the bottom, one of the, well, I had homemade snubbers that I got with the boat, I guess. And um, one of the snubbers was pointed off to the side. And I thought, huh, 
squat, really. And uh, most of what I learned was with a pair of binoculars trying the first night of trolling. I lost two leads in Simon's Bay trying to figure out how to operate the girdies. But so anyway, after a couple days of fishing king salmon, I think we had three for about three days, and we decided to go over to the Cape and try that. And uh, we kept shaking all these small king salmon. All day we shook these small king salmon. <laughs> and they were really pesky, you know. I think we had one or two kings. And so that night I went into the scow, and uh, we were unloading our big handful of king salmon. I was complaining to one of other guys, boy, there were sure a lot of small kings. And he says, well, I didn't catch any. We sure had a lot of cohos around. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that was kind of how it was for me, I guess. <laughs> what I'd like to do right now is uh, take a little break, and then we'll come back here at uh, 8 o'clock. And I'm going to go reset the computer over there to the pictures that I have of the boats. Um, and uh, give you guys all a chance to wander around for, uh, maybe we'll start up, we'll give you guys about a 10 minute break here, start up about 5 after. And get a chance to socialize just a little bit. There's some goodies in the back. Take a look at Matt's pictures, take a look at the slideshow I have there. And uh, then uh, I want you to think about volunteering to come up and tell a few stories of your own. And if you don't, then I will, uh, I will volunteer you, so probably better to volunteer yourself. Anyway, we'll take a break right now. Florida sunshine is famous around the world, and everybody knows about them California girls. October in New England, I'd be there if I could. The only thing that's beautiful is the southern Indiana world. Montana's got the big sky, the speed limit there is great, and the Midwest folks are friendly, it's like one big happy state. The Utah's got the mountains, my skiing is the best, but I've been to Colorado and I wound up in the cast. But Southeast Alaska, all it does is rain, the spring goes in the morning and at night more of the same. Gotta help you in the winter if you're stuck without a plow, and think of in the summer you can see beyond the clouds. Still, I've never seen a place that makes me feel so good. I confess I even like the sight of a girl in a girl takes hood. You can't come crazy, but I know this about the rain. And it makes the place look nice sometimes, and it keeps lots of folks away. Well, I went down to Georgia, ate some peaches off the tree. And a girl from Alabama married my best friend, Randy. Southern and hot daddy's putting in. But I got laid right off the plane when I went to Wyoming Bay In Southeast Alaska, all it does is rain The forecast for the summer is just rain and rain and rain Don't ask me for no sympathy, you got yourself into this mess You might have moved since the early morning and the ghost came to bed Still, I never see a place that makes me feel so good I confess I even like the sight of a girl in a girl's tattoo You can't come crazy, but I know this about the rain the place looks great about once a month and the rest of the time's okay. So the winning number is uh, Lawn Garrison. Got a set of walkie-talkies. <laughs> Donated by Stereo North. And the batteries don't work, but you can get your own battery. Hey, you know, a lot of us talked about our ties to Petersburg. It's come to my attention that uh, one of the matriarchs of our industry is here tonight. And uh, her family, uh, my father started selling fish to Canute Thompson back in the uh, 50s. And I sold fish to Tommy and Harold. And what I said about Harold one time when I finished interviewing him on my show is that our industry is such, is, is so much better 
for the Thompson family having been part of it. And Lorraine Thompson, would you please stand? Let's stand and give Lorraine Thompson a I've ever been to a <laughs> Tell their story instead of hearing mine and I'll uh, chip in if something comes up that's inappropriate. <laughs> I've had some uh, pretty uh, life changing experiences the last few months and they kind of liberated me, so. Uh... <laughs> Hold on to your seats, folks. volunteered to come up and uh, and if you need some fortification maybe my wife Sarah would come up with you and talk about the challenges of raising a family on a small trolling boat with a cranky skipper <laughs> never really part of the problem. The colicky six-week-old baby, um, we got to a point back in the old days on the Wanderer, uh, Crow was younger than that, but that whole first summer with her on board, that we took to drifting and sometimes we even, sometimes we even left the engine running at night because the only time she slept was when the boat was running and so <laughs> so we we did great during the day we caught fish like crazy except there weren't a lot of fish that that season but we caught fish reasonably well and and then at night as soon as the engine would go off bang she'd start to cry and she'd cry all night long and so then I, you know, because Howard had to go catch fish, and all I had to do was clean them. I didn't have to think for that, so I'd get up, and I'd walk around on the back deck. You don't know how many times you can go round and round the hatch on a little tiny troll. Um, it's a great life. I, you know, I wouldn't trade it for anything, and I know there's a lot of other people here that have done it, too. Um, People thought we were crazy. Our parents thought we were absolutely insane. Um, and, and there was one point in time when we got down to LA and I was freaking out because the relatives didn't have um, a car seat to put my young daughter in when we were about to drive out on the LA freeway. And they said, now let me get this straight. You take your kids out on the, bearing, or on the, the Gulf of Alaska in a little tiny boat and you're worried about not having a car seat here? <laughs> no, okay. Um, yeah, no, it's been... I think there's no better way to raise kids because they, they start out, they learn what it's like to work. And, you know, sometimes it took longer to clean a bin board than it did to, you know, do the whole rest of the, you know, the chores at night. But the kids, they all pitched in. They, they all, the two kids. I'm, they pitched in, they always did what they could, and they always wanted to do a little bit more. And now my daughter, who's 20 and um, spending her time in college, says it's really hard to, um, to think of a career somewhere where you're going to be in an office building when you could be out making a living during the summer in southeast Alaska. So we may have ruined her, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I had an opportunity to uh, 
drive by on the drag a couple of times. I'll never forget the time I drove by and there were two gals on top of the cabin in various ballet moves. <laughs> Want to tell me what that was all about? Well, you know, sometimes it gets a little boring out in the dragon. <laughs> Just, they didn't want to get out of shape, so, so yeah, I'm, you know, they, they do ballet during the winter and fish during the summer. It, it doesn't exactly work, but it's, you know, we make it somehow. Yeah. Thanks for coming on up, man. Yeah. Any of the panel members think of uh, another story or two? Well, uh, I have some more people lined up to come up, but I wanted to give the panel members another crack if they uh, thought of something they wanted to sh share right now. Sure. Well, I, I have something after listening to John talk about his 10-inch. Well, turn that on. Make sure it's on. Oh, it's not on? Yeah. I, after listening to John talk about his 10-inch fish, I was, uh, <laughs> I was hand trolling uh, very early in the morning and ended up having a tremendous strike, and it just shook the whole skiff, and to the point where it broke the tag line, it broke the pole, and it almost rolled the boat over because it was so so big. And there were two of us in the skiff, and we immediately went to the opposite side of the skiff, pretty upset about what was going on. But I turned the engine around and started following it, and it pulled us a long ways. The fish would go off to one side, and I'd have to see the line, and then go off to one side. Finally, we got the hand dirty so that we cranked it up to the boat and we had a shark that was about 14 feet long. Mm -hmm. And we ended up running the boat straight up on the beach and then pulling the shark up then. And we did have some shark steaks that were very good. All right. It's a sandwich shark. Well, uh, you know, Charlie uh, talked a little bit about co-op, you know. And when I was younger, I used to love the hell of a fish and the, yeah, it was a lot of all those here, old Norwegians in town, says, go west, young man, go west, I west. But uh, uh, 1964, I was uh, in Anchorage and uh, in, doing the last of my service time, and the t telephone wires just started going like this, you know. And, and I could see the ground start moving, and uh, I says, well, I think you better get on your knees. It's an uh, earthquake, you know, and the whole brass band fell down. but. Anyway, uh, the next year uh, we went halibut fishing in, uh, uh, with uh, Oliver Hofstad on the Angelat. And the co-op had worked like mad to put in a, a dock and a small uh, uh, butler building there to, to do fish uh, there, you know. And I think we were the second boat, so Gordon Jensen was in there at the first and we were in the second boat in the, to that co-op plant. That was a... Uh, well, you know, they had 20,000 feet of dock in uh, in uh, Seward at that time, and when that wave uh, started marching up the inlet, it uh, it took a, a, if it hadn't been for the train in there, you know, it, it changed the way the uh, wave acted, but it took it took all that docking out. It changed uh, Seward's life uh, from uh, being a major import port for northern Alaska but it also, like Charlie says, it took out the uh, co-op dock. But the co-op uh, was very resilient and put the, put another dock in there for, for the next season, so that was the only jobs available in that town at that time. It was a pretty wonderful thing that uh, they, they managed to, to uh, put together a dock so, so that there would be a little work in that community. Uh, Ralph, in the interest of full disclosure, maybe you could tell us why you're not a co-op member. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, uh, I personally think that any young person that uh, uh, was going into the fisheries would be very uh, uh, highly intelligent if they would uh, join the co-op. That doesn't mean that I, I'm entirely without brains, but it's only a small amount. <laughs> but I, I was a, a co-op member for uh, about 25 years. So. I am uh, getting to back to fish flying. I talked to somebody in the audience that uh, worked uh, at fish flying stations, and uh, I think you did too, didn't you? Good job. 
Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to wake you up there. Uh, Mike Glitman, uh, back when I was first starting hand throwing, I went down to uh, Goddard and I thought I was going to homestead out of Goddard until I figured out how the Northwest blew all the heck down there and I moved my operation someplace else if it could be called an operation. But uh, Mike was a uh, fish buyer down there in, uh, in Goddard. And Mike, maybe you could come up and tell us a little bit about what fish buying was like and uh, some of the characters you had to deal with and some of the challenges of uh, making sure you had the right weights. <laughs> I, I've been racking my brains. I can't really think of any good fish buying stories. Eric, I, uh, it, Susan and I ran fish scouts together for several years. Uh, we bought a lot of troll fish. At that time, trolling, uh, king salmon fishing was open April to September. And uh, it was a lot different than it is today. You all know that. But uh, I was thinking back about my first king salmon when I, when I was trolling back before I started buying fish. It was uh, uh, 1974, I think. And I bought this little boat, just like John, a little old derelict for $800. And it had a Chrysler Crown gas engine in it. The Chrysler Crown was a six-cylinder, straight six, flathead engine and uh, I remember it, it had a, an exhaust manifold on it that was you know must have weighed 200 pounds and about five feet long and it was held on there was only three studs left there was two at one end and, and one at the other and uh, that was a wonderful old engine all my stories are about engines and great downs and stuff <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any stories about big days at all but the, I, I, uh, I spent the winter in Juneau winter of 73, 74 and I, I fixed up this boat and then I was going to head out to Elephant Cove and fish for the summer and uh, I heard about this thing called the passes South, <laughs> South Indian Pass yeah. And you had to go through South Indian Pass to get to Elfin Cove from Juneau. And everybody, you know, kind of warned me about these passes, but I, I didn't pay any attention. <laughs> but I, uh, I took this little 28-foot boat I had, Brendan Shaw, and uh, I ran out from Juneau. Long, I forget, I think it might have been one long day I, I ran. And I got to, I got to the... Uh, South Pass about dusk, you know, and uh, I looked at the tide book and I saw it was ebbing, so I knew I'd be able to get through no problem. <laughs> that, that, was, that was quite a boat ride, <laughs> and it was, it was, uh, but I, I, I made it out the other side, and uh, I went to Soapstone. Let's see, I think I anchored up in, in Soapstone Harbor. And the next morning, I got up, and I, I'd gotten over my seasickness by then. <laughs> and and uh, I saw these boats trolling on the Soapstone drag, and I thought, well, that might be a good place to try it. So I, I went out there, and I dropped my gear, and in about five minutes, maybe two minutes, the pole started jumping around, and you know, I, I had a fish, and so I, I pulled my gear, and I had, it was the first salmon I ever caught, it was a 35 pound king salmon. Wow. It, was a, it was a beautiful, beautiful fish. And I somehow managed to get that thing on the boat, and I pulled my gear, and I ran into the buying skeleton. <laughs> that was my first day fishing. <laughs> the rest of the day on the hook.
Well, I, when I was out there in the audience, I uh, had an opportunity to talk to my the guy that I uh, met in 1968. We crewed together for quite a few years, and and he uh, really helped me when I started uh, hand trolling and power trolling, and he's been a good friend of mine uh, in spite of my personality ever since. Fred Fayette, I know you have some interesting stories, especially about when you first started fishing. Why don't you come out and share a couple with us? Well, I'll just tell one about, uh, about the first fish, like people have been doing. Um, I was lucky enough to have a dad that was a shipwright. So the $800 boat that I bought, he helped me fix. And I didn't get up here until uh, sometime in July. But um, got to Petersburg, where there was an old boat called the Illahi that Ralph had. I didn't know him at the time, but I'd been sailing out of Petersburg, so I knew that country a little bit. And um, I didn't have any money. I, I owed the uh, shipyard that I uh, fixed my boat in. I owed the bank. Um, I owed my parents. Uh, and this is just an aside from the first fish. <laughs> <laughs> the guy that runs the coal stories knows the skippers. You know, he doesn't particularly know the, the crew guys, you know. But anyway, I went up there and uh, he just said, you know, uh, whatever I can do for you, I will do. Just consider me when you come to sell your fish. There was no quid pro quo. It was just like, you know, uh, we'd, we'd love to have your fish. And he could see a future. You know, he could see a young guy that was just getting started. And, uh, you know, maybe he'd make it, maybe he wouldn't. But if he did, you know, this was a sort of a long-term investment that he would make just by being the wonderful man that he was, and, um, and giving me some confidence in myself. So anyway, my dad was a shipwright, and we, we'd done all the stuff right on the boat, but we didn't know anything about hydraulics. So we had, uh, I think it was a hydraulic motor that, drew, that was designed to make something work on an airplane, a wing flap or something. and we. Had, rigged it out, and I'd never tested it. Uh, anyway, brought the boat up, went out to go fishing for the first day, and I asked a couple people to tell where should I go, and they said, well, you know, just go out, just go north of town, take a left, start fishing along there. So, <laughs> that's what I did. And it turns out that part of that area is only open to fishing when it's open to gilding which didn't happen to be that day. <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, I got all the gear out. I, I had a hell of a time getting all the gear back because this hydraulic motor was not working. And it, 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 we had a real phony, you know, handle, tighten it up, hold it down with your foot kind of thing. Um, and. Uh, so we would just struggle. I mean, it took an hour and a half to try and get the gear back. And I had one line left, and here comes a skiff. And it's a Saturday, or Saturday or Sunday, any weekend anyway. And uh, the guy on the skiff was an enforcement guy who had been out um, sport fishing. And he said, uh, well, I'm going to have to write you a ticket. You're in violation, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, <laughs> you know, I, I'm completely frustrated because I can't get my gear back. And, I mean, we're actually, you know, uh, we worn out the belt and things were smoking and, you know, we were really trying to pull it in by hand with the, with the vice grips and the whole thing. And, uh, I mean, I wasn't really fishing. I, mean, I, I, I bought my license that morning. And still on, you know, I mean, I, I was like six hours into my fishing career. And, uh, he said, well, you're in violation. I'm going to have to write you a ticket. So we finally, so he, you know, made sure that we were going to quit fishing. So he 
he uh, waited until we got the last line up. And on the very last lure, on the very last line, was the very first king salmon that I ever saw. <laughs> Which was, of course, illegal, so I had to shake it and uh, put my gear back in the boat. And, uh, I actually thought Ralph was going to say something about being loyal to a company, and that's the way it goes in this industry. A lot of people start selling to one fish company, and they sell to them the rest of their life. And I didn't mean to put you on the spot, Ralph, earlier. <laughs> I, I thought that's what you were going to say. <laughs> well, well I, I've been uh, fortunate enough to I fish for PFI for our Petersburg Coal Storage, and then I basically stayed with one company. It was a uh, I was a, actually, I was a co-op member. Uh, I started out in hell of a fishing with my grandfather in, in uh, 1950. So I was a co-op member until I, uh, 1975 when I was started building my boat. And there was a little bit of a, uh, some problems there that I'm not going to mention. So I, that was the last year I was with the co-op. You know. Anyway, uh, I like Fred's story. <laughs> well, another guy who we often hear on the radio from one end of the coast to another, and uh, one of the one of the real exciting things about the troll industry is pursuing the hot bite, or and or, and one of the uh, real exciting things is pursuing the mysterious hot radio bite. And uh, somebody who's probably spent more diesel during his fishing career cruising up and down the coast looking for the hot bite will be our next guest. He's featured tonight with his pictures on the wall. Matt Donahoe, will you come up and tell us about finding the hot bite? cleaning trough, and it's okay for co-hosts, but, you know, if we're out there pitching around and you got a, a big king salmon there, don't take your hand off that king salmon, or, or if you got to do something, take it out of the cleaning trough, lay it down. Okay, boss, he always called me boss. Okay, boss, if I ever lose a king salmon on that cleaning trough, I'll go overboard after him, and I said, don't do that. You know, you know <laughs> just, just take the fish out of the cleaning trough. Okay, boss, I know that's in trouble. So he fished the season, though, and except for a few times not showing up to unload because he had an appointment with a bottle or something, he was all right. And it was when we could still fish king salmon all season, and we were fishing along Icy Point, a nice little peaceful drag there. With, it was rain thicky, and there was a little ocean swell, and you couldn't see very good. And Ray, like fish, he was left handed, he liked fishing the port side. He's, He's, he's got this king salmon, this nice king salmon. It's a dead, it's landed, it's ready to go, and he's cleaning it, and I'm, I'm on the starboard side. And I'm, I'm doing my thing, and I hear this cussing and swearing, and I look over just in time to see this guy taking a flying leap off the stern of my boat. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> he's, he's, he's head to foot with rain gear, you know? He's got, he's got the Southwest hat on, and the, the rain coat, boots, pants, and, and I, I didn't have a... Uh, I couldn't take it out of gear in the cockpit. All I had was the throttle, so I slowed down as, as much as I could slow it down and run to the pilot house and put it in reverse and backed up through my, my float bags. And 
and there's Ray. He's about two feet underwater. When I get to him, he's right on the starboard side. And I reach down, I, 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 I grab the aft stay with one hand, and I reach down and wait. I, mean, I didn't want to go over to it. I reached into the water a couple of feet, and I grabbed him, and I pulled him up. And by God, he, he still had that king salmon in his left hand. <laughs> so I reached down, and I, I grabbed that fish. <laughs> Board, I grabbed him and flipped him aboard. He wasn't real big. He came aboard and minus one boot. <laughs> uh, probably would have saved him only having one boot because he would have been deeper in the water. And I, and I bought him a pair of boots when we got to town. I said, hey, Ray, don't ever do that again. <laughs> that's, that's, that's it. But it's, it's the lonely bite I look for, not the hot bite. I have never run for radio. <laughs> Tell us about a couple times. I'm sure that all that running you have run into the hot bite. Tell us what that's like, or the lonely bite, or anyway. Tell us what. We've heard all these other stories about the first fish or stuff. Part of the romance of this industry is really getting on them. Well, my idea of the, of, the, of the best possible thing you can have is, is what I call the big three good weather, good fishing and no boats. <laughs> you know, a, a, any one of those things is still good with, without all three of them, but you got all three, that's that's as good as you get. <laughs> that, it, we, we, that's happened to me a couple of times, but I don't know how much good fishing I've run away from to, to get that. <laughs> I, I just don't like a crowd, you know. It, I, I, it, I, I'm with the person is that we should outlaw plotters and <laughs> GPSs and it, cell phones. Um, I, I've got no stories about it, Eric. I'm a so low lawyer. Excuse me. Um, Eric asked Mike about um, stories about fish bite, and maybe oh, you oh, could oh, mention. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Here's one. Maybe you could mention some of the lengths you go to avoid having a crowd with you when you're fishing. Gary Mulligan. <laughs> Gary. <laughs> They had a they have a low liners ball. I used to down in PA every year, and, and they, they give awards for you know the high liner, uh, the most whatever you know, the most creative, the biggest liar. And uh, Gary, they had one for that hungry dog award. Gary won the hungry dog award three years in a row, and so they just started awarding it to the second place guy. And just <laughs> <laughs> we were fishing up at uh, Murphy Cove, and Mike was buying fish, and and. Uh, uh, um, the hot bite was on at Yakutat, and we could, nobody could catch anything. We used to be able to go into the bays before the park service kicked us out of there. And Gary and I had found this little bite, and it was, we were fishing in four fathoms, and we were by ourselves, but we couldn't go in and pitch off or fish at night because then the whole, everybody there would know about it. So we'd go in, Mike was buying fish, we'd go in. And Susan. And Susan, yeah, Mike and Susan were buying fish. We, and this was Gary's idea, it wasn't my idea, Mike. <laughs> We go in and pitch off 15 or 20 cone. Now that's all we got. And this one guy, Clay. You remember Clay? He used to have that uh, the Glenmar. Okay. And, yeah, Clay said, goes up to Gary. Gary, he says, my God, I finally beat you. I finally beat you. Gary's got 300 and some cobo in the, in the hole. He doesn't. And after everybody's done unloading, we go over there in the dark and <laughs> pitch the fish off. We did that for I don't know how many days in a row. And had good fish, but I, I think Mike was a little upset about it. Because <laughs> we, we had to bring him into the conspiracy. <laughs> but it was it was Gary's idea. It was fun. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Great story. Yeah, great story. Um, I, uh, it's always reluctant to bring somebody who I used to be a student of up to bite to talk on a panel like this because he might actually uh, reveal how poorly I was as a student. But this guy is also a troller and a longtime uh, friend of mine and uh, former professor at Shelton Jackson College who has some good troll stories. Dave Turcott, come on up.
now are former professors at Sheldon Jackson. <laughs> I can really relate to all these stories everybody's told here. I've done this, been there, done that. Uh, Lower Chatham, uh, Gedney Harbor. I started there in '66, uh, the year after you were there in '65, I think. And uh, so it's been a been a lot of interesting things. Eric said that he says tell a Jim Moore story if you can. Uh, many of you, I think, know Jim Moore on the Al Jack. I fished with Jim, fished around him for many years since the '70s. Uh, there's one that's that's pretty pretty funny. Uh, we were uh, it was about two days before there was going to be a, a closure, and I came to town and I finished a trip and sold and everything. And Jim wanted he, Jim always wanted to fish every hour of every day, period. You know, right to midnight. Those of you that have fished around him, you know what he's like. So anyway, <clears throat> he wanted to go back out to Point Amelia for the last two days didn't have a deckhand, and I says, oh, I'll just jump on with you, and I'll just go with you. So jumped on, and we went out to Point Amelia and, and crashed around out there for part of an afternoon, and there wasn't much going on. So uh, he heard uh, Clay and Jeannie, he heard Jeannie talking on the Glenmar up, and he couldn't figure out quite where they were, but she was talking about these fish she was catching. And uh, finally it dawned on him that they were up at Kaz, and they were up there in the bay back in behind, you know, through Peel's Hole and back in behind there. So he just picked up the CB and he goes, thank you. <laughs> and away we went. And we pulled the gear. We went back there and I pulled my side and he pulled his side. And we took off and we ran, you know, from Point Amelia up to Kaz is over an hour or so or an hour and a half, you know. So we're blasting along there in the Jack, you know, doing eight knots. And, and uh, you know how it is when you come up out of the deep there, Peel's Hole, it goes from X fathoms to about three fathoms, just right now. You know, it's just a it's just a sheer wall into the shallows there. <clears throat> well, it turns out that Jim, like so often some of us do, we, he forgot to pull his light cannonball board. He left it just just under the water, you know, just just down below there, just a little bit. Well, <clears throat> and of course he's got his girdies set up so that if there's a little pull on him, a little extra pull, they'll slip, maybe just a little tiny bit, you know. Well, that light on his side s sat there, and it just very slowly went ratchet, 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 all the way to cast. And it, there must have been 20 or 25 fathoms of wire out by the time we got there, because when we hit that shallow spot, I was I was laying on the wheelhouse floor taking a nap back by the door, and I heard something, just this huge bang out on deck. And I jumped up and looked, and that one gertie had just exploded into a just, just you can imagine at eight knots, this cannonball hangs, you know, and you just and you hit the shallows. <laughs> And so I yelled at Jim, I said, stop the boat, stop the boat, Jim. <laughs> he didn't know what was going on. He's up forward there. He stopped the boat, and I says, I says, there's a cannonball loose back there. And so he's, you know, backing down. We both jumped down in the cockpit, and he's backing up back there in the cockpit, and I'm standing there waving my arms in the air and everything. We go back on the wire and back on the wire. We get back just about to where the cannonball is, and we happen to look up around us, and this is in the days before the sea otters all moved on down here. They were kind of hanging out up in that neck of the woods up there. We, we, we kind of looked around us, there were about 50 sea otters all, you know, they stand straight up in the water like this. <laughs> They're all standing straight up in the water just staring at us from all around. <laughs> what these two idiots were doing? <laughs> Retrieving this cannonball. Yeah. <laughs> So that was pretty. That was pretty interesting. That was a that was a great Jim Moore story. If you've ever been around Jim, why, uh, you know how to be humble all the time if you fish around him. <laughs> He's quite the fisherman. So there you go, Jim Moore story. <laughs> so I think you have the oldest boat in the fleet. You yeah. still have the Mayflower. Right. Well, this is a great audience. I have a boat for sale. <laughs> Hey, hey, go for it. Oh, go, go for it. it. All right, I, I got the, I, I own a Mayflower. It was built in 1891, um, and it is for sale. Hmm? It hasn't been rebuilt since. And it hasn't been rebuilt since. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm changing boats uh, after 27 years on that boat. I'm, I'm uh, gonna just fish a little 28 footer for hand trolling, kind of semi-retire. Next year's number 50, so I want to take time off and. And uh, do that, but um, yeah, the boat's for sale. And it's uh, sixty thousand tonight only. <laughs> Man, this is 
great. I don't have to put it on the paper tomorrow. <laughs> I believe it was rebuilt in Jamestown Bay uh, several years ago. <laughs> uh, I bought it in uh, 81 from Jim Stocks, and that was here in Sitka. And uh, we put it, he, he put it on the beach in about 68 or 69 out there in Jamestown Bay and fiberglass the whole hull, the whole thing. If you remember Bob, Bob Couch and Karen Couch when they were here and had Sitka engine, I think it was Bob's dad made a bet with Jim Stocks that he couldn't fiberglass that hull and make it stick. <laughs> and so they turned that boat over or whatever they did to it and they took it out to Bitscary in the spring and drove it around at 40 knot winds and stuff and the fiberglass stuck. So he got all the fiberglass, all the matte roving and the, and the resin for free. And, that was the bet. <laughs> and it's still sticking too. It's still there. The boat's doing fine. Oh, I have a good deal for you. Oh, do I have a good deal for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, panel members, if, if you got somebody uh, in the audience you want to uh, uh, subject to uh, the terror of public speaking, or you got another story that you want to share? You know, uh, painful stories? I, I, I want to hear, you know, last year he, we had, uh, of course we should mention uh, uh, Sonny Enlo, who passed away unfortunately this fall, but Sonny came up and told about the big seine set that he had over in Deep Inland, $55,000 worth of fish in one set or something like that. It was a great story, and uh, I was hoping somebody would come up and uh, tell us about a really big day trolling that they've had. And I know some of you, and I know some of the panel members have had days like that. Maybe, maybe that's what you were going to tell us, Ralph. But the excitement of being on them, like Matt said, the big three, you know, you're by yourself, the weather's good, and the fish are really there. Well, I was going to tell you about uh, a deckhand, you know, uh, like, you know, Matt had this wonderful story. I, you know, I couldn't believe that I never heard that one before, but uh, I, you know, uh, one one year I went down to Meats Bay, you know, and the Ketchikan guys had told me, uh, you can't catch those king salmon up there in Meats Bay, you know, and, and uh, I thought, well, I'll go down and try it. And I went down and uh, I fished there, you know, one fish one day and six fish the next day, and uh, uh, there's only one other guy there. He, he, he had owned a little uh, boat called the Jaws. Well, uh, then I caught 90 in about an hour. It was fish just rolled in. I thought, boy, you know, there were going to be more fish there next year. So I went down there next year, and uh, the hatchery uh, got so scared that I was going to come down and clean out their run that they uh, moved the markers clear out to the mouth of the bay. You know, and so here I was uh, one day uh, away from the season, and I couldn't think of any place I wanted to go. So I, I had this guy from Juno, and, and uh, I uh, decided I was going to go to Fairweather, you know. And so I, I spent, you know, it, it's about the, oh, 40-some-hour 40, 40 run from uh, Needs Bay to, to uh, uh, Murphy Cove, you know. And so I got up to Murphy Cove, and you know, bushed and uh, I got in there about midnight and I threw the anchor out and, and uh, I was really beat, you know, and pretty soon I hear slap, 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 you know, what was going on? I said, and I said, what's going on down there? He says, uh, there's some mosquitoes in here. <laughs> and, uh, Jeez, I'm trying to get some sleep. Can't you quit? Slap, 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 slap. So I turned my my light on, and and the uh, the whole pile of house was full of mosquitoes. There must have been 10 million in there. You can only, you can almost see the other side of the room. But anyway, so I went and started the the engine up, and the only thing I had to uh, you know was that their uh, clock spray. You know, I, I run across the islands. Over, you know, and anchored up there, 
took me three hours to kill all the mosquitoes in my pilot house. It took me a, about an hour and a half to shovel them over in the morning. <laughs> but that, that's, that's a bite, you know. It's a, you know. for a while and it, uh, it was extremely difficult to get the straight story. <laughs> Somebody want to volunteer to come up? We got time for a couple, two, three more stories out there. The first memory I have of Howard is in uh, Colina Bay on the scow and uh, I still remember that he was unloading fish and then he stepped out in the scow and he had bare feet. And, uh, <laughs> I was pretty impressed by that. <laughs> there was fish, there was fish slime. And, uh, yeah, I, I was impressed, Howard. I still remember uh, this image of your bare feet on the slime in the puddle of water on the scow. But I have to, this whole thing makes me a little nervous. I mean, you were talking about a museum, uh, this heritage museum, you know, it's like there are these dinosaurs out here. <laughs> You know, being put on a shelf. In fact, we're still doing it, you know, uh, somehow. Um, swimming uh, against the economic tide, like uh, salmon swimming against the current. But uh, we're still here, we're still doing it, and uh, hopefully will be for quite a while longer. Um, probably would do a little better at it if you actually do get the code straight. The uh, first time that I coded with a, a coding partner, this was with Bruce. Uh, you know, a quick exchange, some numbers, and I think it was a, a 1 through 10 code with a bad whiskey uh, or something representing the numbers. Are you sure it wasn't the Charleston code? Yeah, yeah it wasn't the Charleston. No, it wasn't Point Baker or uh, Whale Vomit. <laughs> but uh, we're having real good uh, coho fishing, and you know, got out offshore and, you know, at 10 o'clock had over 100 cohos on, so feeling pretty good about that. And, um, talked with Bruce and said, you know, how you doing? I'm trying to add him. I'm busy in the pit. I really don't have time to talk, you know, the bite is happening. But, you know, kind of get up back nonchalant and rattle off the code, you know, uh, number for one, letter for one, letter for two, you know, letter for something, 120, you know, it wasn't even 10, it was more like 9. Seven. And, uh, seven? Yeah, maybe, it was pretty early. And, um, yeah, Bruce held it together real well, he, he didn't show uh, his cards at all, you know, and what was going on, so oh, yeah, it's not much here either, and uh, it rattles off something that starts with a 2, and then a 4, and then something else. I can't believe it. Here I'm having one of my best coho days, mornings I've ever had. It's got me doubled. <laughs> 10 o'clock, so I go back and start throwing coho support. Ah, ah, ah. Yeah, calls back, you know, I lay up over 200. It says, uh, I don't know, 10, 11. Somewhere still before noon. And uh, I had a lot of that, two, five, something. You know, uh, yeah, it's slow over here, too, you know. Uh, three. <laughs> Seven something. <laughs> oh man. It was just, I knew it was, it was about an hour's run down, by, down below me, I think. So I said, uh, finally, I uh, said, the heck with it. You know, I mean, this is good, but there are quite a few boats around. I finally ran through the gear once and uh, it backed off. I mean, it was still good. But <laughs> backed off. So I ran in. Um, Sold them at uh, Whale Bay and uh, got rid of those. It was, we were getting pretty full at that point. Anyway, we'd been out. It was towards the end of a trip. And uh, uh, got some more ice and uh, went out to find, you know, just where Bruce was. And he says, well, I spent the last hour running up to join you. <laughs> so uh, unbeknownst to me, the, th the, third, uh, the third letter on those codes on each of them were blanks. So I got, it's 100 some, 150 some to 20, 250 to 30. So, yeah. Okay, so we've got to be careful on the coding. <laughs> and uh, that's all, uh, uh, keep swimming uh, uh, against the current. <laughs> Thank you.
Now's your chance. Eric, I got a real quick story. I, uh, this is for all the uh, aspiring trollers, I guess. I had a young guy ask me the other day, well, how do you get into fishing? And uh, I guess I, to sum it up, the, uh, at least my history was the first year I used all my life savings and had to borrow heavily to get me through the first year. And the second year, coming up, I had the boat down in Port Townsend getting uh, repaired. And uh, I had a deckhand. Coming up the second year, I completely ran out of money and had just enough fuel to make it to Sitka. And just flat out broke. And uh, I was able to borrow 30 bucks from my deckhand so we could get some groceries. <laughs> and <laughs> We went fishing on a half a tank of fuel, so I always saw that if I had just plugged one fuel filter they had to buy, I probably would have been out of business. But I guess in my case, the, the secret to, uh, to fishing was uh, having a deckhand who could loan you some money. So you could <laughs> There's a lot of stories about poverty in that troll fishery. You know? <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the definition of a highlander is, uh, and I qualify because I, uh, is, uh, you married somebody with a good job. <laughs> Well, I, I'm going to tell a story on Ralph. He's going to be really mad at me because uh, it's an absolute true story. And uh, so we're fishing here in Eastern Channel, and uh, <clears throat> there are a few fish around. And I've been out up at the Derby uh, by being the way station for the Derby, so I haven't really been there. And Ralph calls me and, and uh, tells me what's going on. There's a few fish over here. Eastern Channel and told me what depth and what leader length and what hoochie is hot and of course I knew the flasher that he was running and everything because he uh, carefully instructed me in all those details. And so I said, you got to get up early in the morning though and I, I've been known to sleep, you know, a little bit. But this, <clears throat> so I got up, first cast, I'm not there right behind Ralph and we throw it in gear together and then we BS on a super secret scramble channel and only about 80% of the fleet is cracked in that case. But <laughs> anyway, so we're talking there, and, and uh, we make it about halfway down to Dragon Ralph, uh, which is really unusual for him, says he has to go uh, take care of some business or something anyway. So I'm sitting there behind him, and I haven't got any bites or anything, and I watch him, and he goes out and he runs four liners, and he has 17 kings on him. So I go out and I run my uh, two heavies and I have one fish. So then we're going down to drag and I said, well, how'd you do it? And uh, I said, well, I, I got one. And he said, yeah, well, I got two. Of course, I counted how many he got. So I did. <laughs> and then he quoted me what he really had. So, you know, he was all the up and up. So we go around and we make it around the other half of the drag and he decides we're talking away and about politics or liberal people that we like, and we're both kind of liberal. And uh, he goes out and runs, uh, runs his gear again, and I'm following him again. And uh, I think he had 17 the first time. This time he had 16 kings on the gear. And uh, I watched him pull all those. And of course, I got the same Gucci and the same flash and the same depth, and we're going the same speed because I'm right behind him. And so I'm kind of disgusted. So I, but I had had a wiggle, so I'm out go out there running, expecting to have seven or eight fish on this wire like Ralph had on his. And I, uh, I go through all the gear, and I have two more. So I'm up to three, and Ralph has 33. <laughs> and I go in, and uh, he's busy cleaning, still cleaning like mad. 
and he gives me some signal, you know, oh boy, I'm really sure. So I go running out in the back deck, and I pull all my gear, and I stack it, and I go down to readout. And uh, I had three, and I got two at readout, so I ended up the day with five. So, and I ain't talking to Ralph, I turned off the radio all day. <laughs> well, so, early the next morning I get out, and I turn on the radio, and Ralph calls me, and I, in a weak moment, I answer. And so he's trying to make me feel good. He says I should wander back, you know, in code language. And, and uh, then he, uh, Ralph can be a little bit insufferable at times. He coached me his actual score for the day before, which was 80-something. And he says, I, they're biting a little better than they were yesterday right now. <laughs> so I, uh, I actually do have a little bit of sense in me, and I pulled my gear and ran over there and got behind him, and, and I did end up getting a few, but uh, that was the day Ralph caught 80-something and I caught five. And there were some other days like that, too, so that's a true story. Well, that about wraps it up here. I, I wanted to... So unless somebody else really has a story they want to share. Um, I want to thank uh, Rebecca for inviting me. I wasn't sure I'd be able to do this this year, but it really has invigorated me, and I had a lot of fun putting together the slideshow over there. It's nothing like maps, of course, but uh, those of you, when we get done here, be sure to go by and look at uh, both sets of pictures. I want to thank Ralph for um, mentioning romance right at the beginning and setting a tone for this uh, meeting and uh, all the great stories we had it was just uh, wonderful and uh, there is a picture over there of explorers basin for those of you that my mother took and uh, nice picture i think in about 1964 and uh, you know it, it came up but we never really talked about it but i have to confess that my my first day hand trolling when I really got serious about it in 1978, these people mentioned how important humpies were to them when they were starting out. They were important to me. I went up to Rose Channel and loaded my skiff with uh, humpies. So we, we didn't get into the humpy stories tonight, but they are <laughs> part of the troll, uh, troll legend. And uh, somebody mentioned about not knowing for sure what depth they ran. And there was a lot of talk about crew members. Let me tell you, I had my two sons who both have advanced college, well, one has an advanced college degree and another has a college degree. And, and uh, one of them, I don't think, ever got a B in math in high school. But believe me, even with one fathom gear, they could not get the depth right <laughs> for many years. <laughs> so my partners had asked me how, how deep I was fishing when I coded the score, and I, the answer was always mystery depths. <laughs> <laughs> and now we went to one and a half fathom gear, and God, it, it is really a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't, I, I have all kinds of marks, and then I found out my wife has synesthesia where each color is associated with a certain depth, and so the marks I had weren't the right color for the right depth. Oh my God. <laughs> anyway, uh, but there, one of the people mentioned that there was a uh, lowliner award there in, um, in Port Alexander, and I hadn't heard about that, but it just happened this year that Doug Rendell and I formed a group. We were out there coding with uh, my son and Howard on the chum fishery, and we were just getting smoked, of course. So uh, Doug Wendell, uh, who had the Woodstock now, and I formed a group called Lowliners Anonymous. <laughs> but we've been having a hard time figuring out how to invite people to join our group. <laughs> we've come up with some people that we think would would fit in, but uh, <laughs> we, we haven't been in. And then it was, it was the next day 
the National Fisherman called me, and Doug said, I don't qualify for the group anymore either. <laughs> so anyway, uh, if any of you have any really good ideas about how we can uh, grow our group, Low Riders Anonymous, please talk to me privately. <laughs> anyway, it's been a great evening. The society's doing great. I'm really thrilled that we've had the chance to uh, MC, and we've, we've had great stories and a great panel. Let's give ourselves all a big, big hand. Eric, I have one little tidbit that I'd kind of like to share about our fish. Um, I've been direct marketing my own salmon since 1997. Is this kind of like fishing over the line? <laughs> Fishing both sides of the line. But uh, I had an experience in San Francisco with the fish. It always bothered me when I'd go down there and I wouldn't see wild fish in the stores. And about the time the price dropped out of our fish, I started hustling around and trying to sell my fish. And I went to a place called Drager's Market. And I, I went there because I found a, a little article in the paper that talked about $17 bottles of spaghetti. And I thought, if they could pay $17 for a bottle of spaghetti, they certainly need to see a wild fish. So I went to this beautiful store in San Francisco that had an escalator going up in the top, that had a, a five-star restaurant up there, and was just elegant from food all around the world. And uh, this is it. So I called, I called Drager's Markets, and I couldn't get through to the fish buyer. And uh, so I left messages that I was in town, and I had frozen a sea salmon that I'd like to show them some. And I'd been there three weeks, and I hadn't heard from him, and I must have called him a dozen times. And so I went to the store, and I got one of the women behind the counter, and I said, listen, I need to talk to the boss of Ice Fish, personally. And so I got the special number, and I called him, and I said, I have wild Alaska salmon. It's the best tasting, healthiest fish that you can get, and you're missing out if you don't try this. And he said, listen, did you notice that I didn't return your calls? I said, yeah, yeah, I did. He said, well, that's because I won't have a frozen fish in my store. He said, I've got, I've got farm fish from Scotland. I've got farm fish from Norway. I've got the best that they can have. And I said, well, you know, I've been in your store, and you have an elitist clientele, and you're not offering the best because you don't have a lot of salmon in there. And I said, and if you want to try one, I'll give you one. And he says, if you can get one here in an hour, then I'll consider it. And I was in San Francisco during traffic and managed to get there, and I had the fish in the trunk of the car. So I walked up to his office, and I plopped this frozen fish on his desk. And he said, I'm going to take this fish, and I'm going to give it to my chef down there in the five-star restaurant, and I'm going to invite my managers in to try this fish. And then maybe you'll hear from me, maybe you won't. So two weeks later, I got a call, and he ordered 5,000 pounds of fish. <laughs> and I said, well, how did this come about? And he said, well, the wild sand won in all four categories that we put up there. They put a, a category of taste, texture, aftertaste, and I forget what the last one was, but the wild fish won in all four counts, and the people eating the fish had no idea which fish was which, if they were getting the farm fish or the wild fish. And I thought it was a pretty strong uh, statement that the wild fish made being able to, to win in all the categories in a five-star restaurant. <laughs> That's it, folks. Florida sunshine is famous around the world, and everybody knows about them California girls. October in New England, I'd be there if I could. The only thing is beautiful is the Southern Indiana wood. Montana's got the big sky, the speed limit there is great, and the Midwest folks are friendly, it's like one big happy state. The Utah's got the mountains, my skiing is the best, but I've been to Colorado and I wound up in a cast. But Southeast Alaska, all it does is rain, the spring goes in the morning and at night more of the same. Gotta help you in the winter if you're stuck without a plow, and think of in the summer you can see beyond the clouds. It makes me feel so good I confess I even like the sight of a girl in a girl's hood You can't come crazy But I know this about the rain And 
it makes the place look nice sometimes and it keeps lots of folks away. Well, I went down to Georgia, ate some peaches up the tree, and a girl from Alabama married my best friend Randy. Southern hospitality is pretty near as good as they say, but I got laid right off the plane when I went to Wyoming Bay. In Southeast Alaska, all it does is rain. The broadcast for the summer is just rain and rain and rain. Don't ask me for no sympathy, you got yourself into this mess. You might have moved since the early morning and big old skate the best. Still, I never see the place that makes me feel so good. I confess I even like the sight of a girl in a girl's ditch. And you can't come crazy when I know this it's about the rain. The place looks great about once a month and the rest of the time's okay. city that lots of people hate but i've been back there many times that everyone's been great arizona's canyon is as big as i have seen and texas in the springtime is every cowboy's dream but i spent a summer around the sitka in a cabin in the woods been to catch a can and wrangle they were just as good Got the world's biggest halibut with the bonnet boys of Tennessee. And the loop road back to June, I saw a black bear in a tree. Who knew met the Cali cake? It's always the same to me. And Peter's book's the one place that I'm always glad to be. So you can take your face cruise and say good call, seven seas. Cause England is the only place that I've got left to see. Cause South East Alaska, man, I really love that rain. And I don't care if I ever see the sun come out again. I'll take a sip of you get there. Across the land and truckers hauling loads. This one is a story about a different kind of way of traveling from town to town and running out the day. It's called the Blue Water Highway. Ain't no road like it in the world. Up the inside passage from Seattle to Skagway on the Blue. A floating junior prom And all the hippies still lay on the top deck Passing round the bum The forward lounge, a tourist way To spot the whales blow And all the little pets are in their cars Four decks below On the blue water highway Ain't no road like it in the world Up the inside passage From Seattle to Skagway On the blue Taking that blue ferry about as far as it can go. The kind of tycoon, malice being I've been on them all. The good times I've been in the staterooms, back crashed on the decks. But every time with the turbines wind, the sleep I gets the best. It's on the blue water highway. Pulling out at midnight for Petersburg. 
Miss the hillsides passing, watch the blue turn into gray. Waiting for the next town, still 13 hours away. Three straight days of sitting here, thinking of you all the way on the blue. pack along the dusty no slope hall road when along came a semi with a high canvas covered load if you're going to fairbanks mag with me you can ride and so i climbed into the cab and i settled down inside he asked me if i'd seen a road with so much dust and sand and i said listen bud I've traveled every road in this great land. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. Cross the tundra of bear, man. I breathe the mountain air, man. I travel out ahead in my share, man. I've been everywhere. I've been to Bear Road, Juno, you know, North Pole, Mantle, Canada, Katsabu, Anchorage, Juno, Alaska, Soda, Dutton, Ketchup, Can, Coy, Cook, Stone, River, Sleep, New Petersburg, Adela, Rattle, Lag, Nug, Dead Horse, Keen, I, Cap, Mike, Cusk, Green, Plug, Wamp, Fruit, Bay, Dutch, Chubba, White, Silla, I'm a killer. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. Cross the tundra, Bear, man. I breathe the mountain air, man. I travel out, have my share, man. I've been everywhere. I've been to Kodiak, Fognak, Chugiak, Nack, Nack, Old Harbor, Isaac, Cape Thorn Bay, Yakaport, Heidelberg, Yakutat, Hoover Bay, Nome, Ruby, Chichika, Franco, Nails, Cross, Point, Scar, Harbor, Moose Pass, Eagle River, Hawk, and a Dead Horse, Dot Lake, Ock Lake, Wanna Lake, Bobby, Sick. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. Cross the tundra of Bay, man. Breathe the mountain air, man. I travel out of having my share, man. I've been everywhere. I've been to Kiska, Attu, Adak, Chignick, Skagway, Lusser Bay, Northway, Tower, Keep the Creek, Cake, Hainsey, Long Hughes, Plateau, Chickaloon, Chitta, Cheetah, Glen, Allen, Kibalina, Togi, Akin, Allen, Pete, St. Michael, Manicot, the Crooked Creek, Cherokee, see what I mean? I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. I cross the tundra of Bethlehem, man. I breathe the mountain air, man. I travel out ahead in my share, man. I've been everywhere. I've been to Homer, Beth, Gus, Davis, Cole, Dover, Glacier Bay, Bellsfield, Ditcher, Drugs, and Ely, Hammer Falls, Pass, Antioch, Sandpoint, Shagalur, Kumi, and Rampart, King Cove, Coatfoot, Taylor Mountains, Brooks Range, Edge, Coombe, Thunder Mountain, Anna, Tudor, Willis City, Mount McKinnon, what a pity, I've been everywhere, man, I've been everywhere, man, I cross the tundra of Bay, man, I breathe the mountain air, man, I travel out, have my share, man, I've been everywhere, man, I've been everywhere. Lost $400 in a card game to tell her. Uh, buddy Doug out in Port Alexander. Everybody in Port Alexander is named Doug, Mike, Bob. Uh, Mr. Feaster out there in Circle. Don't forget about Douglas. People who get a little bit upset if you forget about Douglas. Uh, spend a summer out in Seward. Not a bad, not a bad summer.
escape to city lights Figured someplace far away and be the place to fix her life A bit of lot of dead end jobs The Florida sunshine is famous around the world And everybody knows about them California girls October in New England, I'd be there if I could The only thing that's beautiful is the southern Indiana wood Montana's got the big sky, the speed limit there is great And the Midwest folks are friendly, it's like one big happy state Utah's got the mountains, where skiing is the best But I've been to Colorado and I wound up in the cast But Southeast Alaska, all it does is rain The spring goes in the morning and at night more of the same Gotta help you in the winter if you're stuck without a plow And think of in the summer you can see beyond the cloud Still I've never seen a place that makes me feel so good I confess I even like the sight of a girl in a girl's tattoo You can't come crazy but I know this about the rain it makes the place look nice sometimes and it keeps lots of folks away. Well, I went down to Georgia, ate some peaches up the tree. And a girl from Alabama married my best friend Randy. Southern hospitality is pretty neat and as good as they say. But I got laid right off the plane when I went to Wyoming Bay. In Southeast Alaska, all it does is rain. The forecast for the summer is just raining.